Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to our revision session. We're going to go over some really important content tonight, so it is important that you do revise this stuff. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the League of Nations and why it failed. So let's go back to the very beginnings of the League. Um, where are we? Here we go. You should be able to see the screen that I'm sharing with you. Just to check that you can. One second, go on Teams and share screen. Click on that. Get the red box around it. Now you should be able to see the textbook page that I am using. You have access to this textbook page on the Caboodle website. The code is PX7. So if we're thinking about the League of Nations and why it failed, there's some key components that we need to think about. Now, the first one is about the way the League is structured. The League was structured for failure, I would argue. Okay, The League found it difficult to do its job in the 1930s because of the way it was set up. The Covenant was the way that the League was going to deal with disputes. And within the Covenant, you have mitigation, getting countries to talk through their problems, moral condemnation, giving a country a good telling off, and imposing, finally, economic sanctions. Economic sanctions is powerful, as is moral condemnation. If you feel that the whole world is telling you off, then it's going to have an impact. If the whole world is saying they're not going to trade with you, then that could create problems. So moral condemnation and economic sanctions are good. But at the end of the day, are these things easy for an aggressive power to ignore? If a country is being aggressive, then it might just ignore moral condemnation or economic sanctions. And we see that with the Manchurian crisis. When, econ when moral condemnation was imposed on Japan, they simply said, well, stuff it. We don't care. We're going to leave the League of Nations. So unfortunately, these methods of keeping peace were not as effective as they could be. Now, sticking with the league structure and how it was set up in some ways for failure, we need to have a look at the Assembly. Now, the Assembly was the most powerful branch of the League of Nations. It decided who could join the League. It decided on the League's actions on other countries. And there were 42 nations that represented the Assembly in the beginning, and it acted a bit like an international parliament. Now, unfortunately for the League of Nations, the Assembly only met once a year, which is obviously going to make it very difficult for the League to do its job to keep peace. What made the, job, the situation even more tricky is that for the Assembly to decide upon a course of action on a country, the vote had to be unanimous. We have to get 42 different nations all voting the same way. And that was really, really difficult. And that definitely impacted the League's ability to do its job later on. OK, so the council was formed in response to this situation and the council was going to meet more frequently, um, more frequently than the assembly. But the big issue is that the council had the power to veto anything that the assembly decided. So if by some miracle, 42 nations all vote the same way, then if it didn't, if the council didn't agree with it, then the council could veto it, even if it was good for the world. Now, Britain, France, Italy and Japan were permanent members of the council, which means they always got a say. And we're going to look at it later on. But Britain and France behave in a very selfish way regarding the league. If a decision is not in their favour, then they might veto it. If it's not a decision that is going to benefit Britain or France in any way, even if it's good for the world, they have the power to veto it. And we see that selfish attitude later on. So sticking with the structure now of the League of Nations and how it was set up for failure, we have to have a look at the Permanent Court of International Justice. We have 11 judges who sit and listen to the parties who are involved in an argument. So Germany and France, they might present their arguments to the court and the court would then rule based on the evidence, which is a really, really good thing. Unfortunately, the Court of Justice could only advise the parties involved. Their decisions were always advisory and never compulsory. And as a result, it made it difficult for League to do its job in the future. OK, so 
just some examples there of how the league was set up and how that structure was going to make it difficult for the league to do its job later on. Okay, so let's take another one and let's think about the USA not being a member and how that impacted the League of Nations and affected its ability to keep peace. So the USA refused to join the League of Nations. They were following a policy of isolationism after World War One. They felt that getting involved in World War One was a mistake and they wanted to avoid being dragged into another European conflict at all costs. So they were following a policy of isolationism. And even though Woodrow Wilson, their president, came up with the League of Nations, the American government refused to join. Now, how does that impact the League's ability to do its job? Well, it does it in two fronts. The first way is that the Americans are a big trade, trading nation. The USA is a massive trading nation. And if they were involved in the league and economic sanctions, it would have meant economic sanctions were way more effective. Because if America says, we're not going to trade with you, that would definitely make a country think twice. Because America is such an important trading nation for so many countries around the world. Okay. Um, <clears throat> We see this become an issue when we look at Manchuria because the League wanted to impose economic sanctions on Japan to discourage them from invading Manchuria. Unfortunately, those economic sanctions would not work because Japan's main trading partner was the USA and the USA was not a member of the League of Nations. So Japan would have just carried on trading with America. So America not being involved in a league definitely hit economic sanctions hard. Furthermore, the Americans have a massive army. They're respected as one of the world's superpowers. Now, I know the league doesn't have an army, but maybe if America was involved, the league could have had an army, which would have made it so much more effective when dealing with aggressive nations. So that's another reason why the League of Nations struggled to keep peace because America was not involved. The next one we're going to have a quick look at is the fact that Britain and France were very selfish in their approach to the League. They should have been upholding the values of the League as permanent members of the Council. But they chose to ignore the League at times and focus on their own problems. And as a result of this, the League struggled massively to keep peace. The best example of this is within the Abyssinian crisis when Italy chose to invade Abyssinia. Britain and France should have kept their League of Nations responsibilities and stood up to the Italian aggression. Unfortunately, they didn't. If we zoom in a little bit and have a look at the Suez Canal, Britain and France could have closed the Suez Canal, which should have made Italy have to sail the long way around Africa to get to Abyssinia. And this would have forced Italy and Mussolini to think twice about his invasion, their invasion plans. Now, why didn't Britain and France close the Suez Canal? because they cared more about their own interests. They were trying to keep Mussolini on side to combat the threat of Hitler. Mussolini had signed the stress affront along with Britain and France, and Britain and France wanted to keep Mussolini on side to deal with the threat posed by Hitler. So they didn't want to upset him by closing the Suez Canal. And as a result, they kept it open, which basically meant that the League of Nations, Britain and France, had abandoned Abyssinia. And that's not what they should have been doing. Another example of Britain and France caring more about their own interests than the League of Nations is the Hort Lavelle Pact. Before the invasion of Abyssinia, Britain and France, the British Foreign Minister and the French Foreign Minister met in secret to decide what should be done with the Abyssinian crisis. And they decided that it was best for everybody if Italy is allowed to take huge areas within Abyssinia. Not good for the Abyssinians, but it's good for everybody else because it would avoid a potential war. Now, 
Italy didn't know about this pact, neither did the Abyssinians. The British and French foreign minister did it in secret. But it does show what Britain and France are willing to do to protect their own interests. They were willing to abandon Abyssinia to protect what they wanted. And a final example of Britain and France being behaving in a very selfish way regarding the League of Nations and their responsibilities for the League of Nations comes with trade sanctions against Italy. When Italy invaded Abyssinia, Britain and France and the League jumped into action and they imposed economic sanctions, said, hey, look, we are doing something about this. But unfortunately, they did not impose sanctions on the big industries like oil, steel, iron and coal. They continued trading those with the Italians. Why? One, they didn't want to upset Mussolini. They wanted to keep him on side. But two, this is on the back of the Wall Street crash and the British and French economies are not strong. And if we stop trading steel, iron and coal with the Italians, we're going to hurt the Italians, but we're also going to hurt our own economies. So for our own interests, we don't impose sanctions on the big industries. And it says just at the bottom there that Mussolini later said that if coal and oil had been banned, he would have had to stop his invasions. He wouldn't have had the fuel for his tanks. So we had the opportunity to protect Abyssinia if we decided to stand up and uphold the values of the League of Nations rather than protecting our own interests. We protected our own interests and as a result, Abyssinia was invaded. The League was failing. Okay, so Britain and France being very selfish, their self-preserving attitudes. Let's have a look at one more. There are other things, other reasons why the League failed. You might want to focus on Manchuria. The League's reluctant to act, reluctance to act in Manchuria and the fact that they could not control their own member, Japan, from invading a smaller, weaker nation just showed that the League really couldn't live up to expectations. It was not able to do its job properly. Okay, definitely contributing to its failure to keep peace later on. Let's scoot back though to the Wall Street crash. This is another big one that affected the League in a negative way. I like the title of this page, The Decline of International Cooperation. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So the Wall Street crash happened on the American Stock Exchange. It's a financial crash on Wall Street in America. But because American banks had loaned out so much money to European nations after World War I, they now wanted that money back. And that caused an economic crisis around the world, especially within Europe. And as a result of that, there was a decline in international cooperation between countries. Countries had their own problems to focus on before they focused on the world issues. And as a result, this hit the League of Nations very, very hard. Okay. Also, this would have affected the League's ability to impose its main weapon. It didn't have an army, but it could impose economic sanctions, trade sanctions. But after the Wall Street crash, countries were less willing to impose economic sanctions. One second, everybody. Hold on, my screen's gone. So countries were less willing to impose economic sanctions because economic sanctions would hurt the country that you're targeting, but countries' economies were suffering all over Europe. So you might hit said country, but that's going to affect your own economy as well. And as a result, countries were let, or rather the League, was less willing to impose its main weapon, economic sanctions. And that hit the League hard, made it difficult to keep peace. Another example, and I'm not going to discuss this now, are the kellogg briand Pact and the Locarno Treaties. Both of these were great for the world. It made the world safer, but because they were signed outside the leagues, um, outside of the League of Nations, the League of Nations were not involved in either of them. It gave anybody that was critical of the League ammunition they needed to kind of get rid of the League. They could simply say, hey, look what we're able to achieve without the League getting involved, sticking its nose into other people's business. We don't need a League of Nations. So these two were very negative for the League. You might want to talk about its failures throughout the 1920s. That definitely affected its ability to do its job later on. So there are a number of things there that focus on why the League struggled to keep peace throughout the 1930s.
So let's have another look at another let's have a look at another major event which you definitely need to know about. And that is the Rhineland. Wrong way, my apologies. Let's go this way. Here we go, the Rhineland. Now you need to know all about this. You need to know the story of the Rhineland. So why did Hitler want it? Well, if you look at the bottom of the page on six, page 60, you can see that France signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. It became known as the Franco-Soviet Pact. And Hitler quickly used this as an excuse. He said, hey, look, I'm now surrounded by enemies and I need to defend my borders. So that gave him the excuse he needed to march his troops back into the Rhineland. Now, many countries felt that Hitler was only reclaiming what was rightfully his. The Americans said that he was marching his troops into his own back garden. And he said to the world, hey, look, I'm not being aggressive. I just want to defend my border against my um, enemies. And countries accepted that. But deep down, Hitler had another agenda. Hitler realized that if he was going to focus east and achieve Lebensraum, part of his fallen policy promise, he was going to have to defend this border. If he's not defending this border and he invades Poland, France could just march on into Germany. Now, he didn't tell the world that, but that was one of the main reasons why he wanted to remilitarize the Rhineland. Now, Britain, France and the League of Nations did nothing about this. OK, they turned a blind eye to it. They followed the policy of appeasement. And you need to have a quick read over what Britain or why Britain, France and the League did not act. And this caused a crisis. It ensured that Hitler grew in confidence and that led on to problems in the future. So make sure you know about why Hitler wanted it, how Britain and France and the League didn't really act and how that caused problems in the future, it caused a crisis in the future. And if you have a look for here, this is some of the problems caused by the lack of action regarding the um, reoccupation of the Rhineland. So Hitler grew confident and he started to now look for other ways that he might overturn the Treaty of Versailles. And what comes after the remilitarization of the Rhineland? Anschluss. So you could argue that this, or the lack of actions here, led on to future crises in Europe, Anschluss being one of them. Britain and France started to rearm and you could argue that this is a crisis in itself because we don't want countries with big armies. Woodrow Wilson approached the treaty at Versailles wanting an arms reduction to keep the world safer. Um, France had treaties with the Soviet Union, but really didn't do anything to stop Hitler's invasion of, not invasion, but reoccupation of Rhineland, and this became a crisis. Mussolini now signed a non-aggression pact with Hitler. It was called the Rome-Berlin Axis. Up until this point, Mussolini had been on the side of Britain, France and the Soviet Union. He'd signed the stress affront. But now, having seen how weak Britain and France were in dealing with Hitler, Mussolini refought his friendships, I suppose, and he decided to now align himself with Hitler. And this was definitely a crisis. And just at the bottom, it says Hitler is now able to defend his western border, which means he could concentrate on Lebensraum. How is he going to achieve Lebensraum? He's going to have to invade other countries. So make sure you know this story. Make sure you know the story of the Rhineland and you can comment on why Hitler wanted it. The fact that Britain, France and the League did nothing and then the crisis which arose out of that. OK. So we've covered the Rhineland. We've covered the failures of the League of Nations. There's two more events that I want to talk to you about. And the first one is the Sudeten crisis. You need to know about the Sudeten crisis and the failure of the policy of appeasement when dealing with the Sudeten crisis. OK, so Hitler said that he wanted to invade, not invade, but take control of the Sudetenland, the orangey area there within Czechoslovakia. 
There are three million Germans living there. And Hitler says that he wants to save them. He wants to protect them. And one of his um, foreign policy aims was to reunite the Volksdeutsch. And people understood what he wanted to do. It's not like the Germans were well treated by the Czechs. And Hitler says, hey, look, all I want to do is save them. And this land, it was part of Germany before the Treaty of Versailles. On top of this, and Hitler didn't make this public, there were lots of railways, industries and forts within the Sudetenland, and that would have aided Hitler's war efforts. So he set his eyes on the Sudetenland. Now, Britain wanted to avoid a fight at all costs. Chamberlain and Britain were following a policy of appeasement to give Hitler a little bit of what he wanted in the hope that you keep him happy and you don't start another war. So, Chamberlain flew to Berchtesgaden to meet with Hitler. Hitler made it very clear that he was willing to fight for the Sudetenland. Chamberlain, terrified of another war and following a policy of appeasement, wanted to keep Hitler happy. So he flew and met with the Czechs. Bear in mind Chamberlain had promised to protect Czechoslovakia after Hitler invaded Anschl um, sorry, completed Anschluss with Austria, Chamberlain in Britain said that we would protect Czechoslovakia because it looked like Czechoslovakia was going to be next. So Chamberlain, he met with Hitler. Hitler made it very clear that he was going to fight for Czechoslovakia. So Chamberlain moved, or not moved, or flew to meet with the Czechs. And he basically strong-armed the Czechs. He forced them to agree to Hitler's demands to hand over Sudetenland. Just one second, guys, just while I speak with Mrs. Green. Do you know what? I recorded I recorded it and it didn't record. So I, here I am recording it all over again so I can post it to show my homework and YouTube for everybody else. Do you want to meet with us at this stage? It should be fine. I don't know why I think it might not be fine, but I think it should be fine. Yes, by all means. A little one it is. There. Awesome. Ah, brilliant, miss. Um, yeah, I'll catch you tomorrow. Wow, it's just annoying, isn't it? I just said it once, now I have to say it all again. I've nearly finished, though, second time round. Do you take care? Right, sorry about that, guys. Just talking to Mrs. Green, as you might have guessed. So, going back to appeasement and the Sudeten crisis. Hitler made it clear that he was going to fight for the Sudetenland. So Chamberlain, terrified of another fight, flew to meet with the Czechs. And he basically forced them to agree to Hitler's demands. He said that Britain would not protect Czechoslovakia if they forced Hitler to invade. So it was all like their fault for forcing Hitler to invade. So they agree to hand over Sudetenland. Chamberlain then returns to Germany on September the 22nd and tells Hitler that he's achieved everything that Hitler wants. I've got you everything you wanted, Hitler. And at this point, Hitler changes his demands. And this is where we see Hitler taking advantage of the situation. He knows Britain wants to avoid war. He knows Britain is following a policy of appeasement and he takes advantage of that. And he says to Chamberlain, thanks, but now I want more. I want the Sudetenland to be handed over by the 1st of October, which is much sooner than it was agreed, and that Hungary and Poland also receive some of the Czech land. Now, this was not what Hitler and Chamberlain had agreed upon before, and panicked, Chamberlain calls a meeting in Munich, the Munich Conference, where they agree upon the Munich Agreement. Okay, um, Britain and France, they meet with Hitler and the Czech government, and they decide that it's best to actually agree to Hitler's demands. It would help to avoid another war. Okay, And really, this is Britain and France agreeing to Hitler's demands. And Hitler must have felt so confident that he could take advantage and demand whatever he wanted, and everybody in Europe is just scrambling to try to keep Hitler on side. So his new demands were agreed upon, provided he makes a promise not to invade the rest of Czechoslovakia, which he does. Unfortunately, within six months, Hitler's gone back on that promise, and he's invaded the rest of Czechoslovakia. 
appeasement seems to have abandoned the Czechs to Hitler's aggression. And this is a big turning point because this is the first time that Hitler has invaded a country to which he has no legitimate claim. He had a claim to the Sudetenland, but not the rest of Czechoslovakia. And this is very, very significant. So, make, there's more to this, and you're going to have to do some reading. You've got the Caboodle website, you've got the online textbook, the code's PX7, so make sure you are reading around this and you know about the Sudeten crisis and how the policy of appeasement seemed to abandon Czechoslovakia to German aggression. The one last event that I'd like to talk about, which you definitely need to know about, is the Nazi-Soviet Pact. Now, Hitler always had his eyes set on Poland and countries in Eastern Europe. He wanted to achieve Lebensraum and he wanted to reunite the German speakers into this greater Germany. So, he was terrified though that if he invaded Poland, he might get hit from one side by France and then another side by France's ally, the Soviet Union and Hitler would be caught in this pincer movement, okay? So he needs to get one of them on side, and it's much easier to get the Soviet Union on side. So Hitler, he meets, or at least Germany meet with the Soviet Union. Hitler sends one of his most trusted men, his foreign minister Ribbentrop, to meet with Stalin, and they agree upon a non-aggression pact. Stalin had seen how weak Britain and France were in dealing with Hitler, and Stalin had no confidence that Britain or France would protect the Soviet Union if Hitler invaded. So this is a prime example of keeping your friends close, but your enemies closer. Stalin hoped that he'd be able to keep an eye on Hitler if they were friends, if they signed this non-aggression pact. Now, this is what gave Germany the green light to invade Poland and start World War II. Germany now knew, Hitler now knew, that if he invaded Poland, all he had to worry about was France hitting him from the West, because the Soviet Union in the East is now on his side and actually are going to help Hitler to invade Poland. So this basically gave him the green light to invade Poland, and that's what started the war. Now, it's definitely worth knowing why Stalin signed this non-aggression pact. Why had he lost faith in Britain and France? And these bullet points here definitely link to that. So I'm going to read a few of them out, and I want you to make sure that you are revising all of this within the time that you have left before your exam. Okay, so the first bullet point that is, says that when Stalin joined the League of Nations in 1934, he witnessed how weak the League was, Britain and France mainly, in dealing with the Manchurian crisis, the Abyssinian crisis and the crisis in the Rhineland. Stalin felt that Britain, not Britain, sorry, the League, Britain and France would not protect him from Hitler's threats. So another one, in 1934, the USR, USSR and France had signed an agreement stating that France would protect Germany, uh, Russia from a German invasion. But when Hitler remilitarized the Rhineland, France did nothing. So if Hitler invaded Russia, would France protect Russia? Probably not. So Stalin started to look for other allies, namely Hitler. Britain and France were following a policy of appeasement. And they had done nothing to stop German aggression throughout Europe, throughout the 30s. They allowed Germany to rearm, to complete the Anschluss, to take Czechoslovakia, and they did nothing about it. Stalin thought, well, can I now trust them to protect me if needed? After the Sudeten crisis, Chamberlain called a uh, meeting in Munich where they signed the Munich Agreement, agreeing to Hitler's demands for the rest of Czechoslovakia. Stalin was not invited. He was not even consulted. He felt totally disrespected by Britain and France. And as a result, he started to reevaluate his friendship and started to look towards Hitler. And there's one more that I'd like you to focus on, and we've already mentioned it, bottom bullet point just here. Hitler sent his top guy to negotiate with Stalin. Stalin felt utterly disrespected by Britain and France after the Munich conference. And here is Hitler sending one of his top guys. 
Stalin, it seemed to Stalin that Hitler valued him and respected him. And as a result, Stalin signed the non-aggression pact, the Nazi-Soviet pact. And that gave Hitler a green light to invade Poland, which caused, ultimately caused the Second World War. So you need to make sure you are revising the Nazi-Soviet pact, the Sudeten crisis and the failure of appeasement. Why the League of Nations failed, we mentioned lots of reasons at the beginning. And you also need to revise the, um, the Treaty of Versailles. And that was part of last week's revision. That was what last week's revision session was on. So please use that as well. So thank you very much. Make sure you revise this content. Any questions, come and see me and ask. Let's talk about things. And next week's revision session will focus on exam structure, how to best structure answers for the four different questions. So I bid you farewell. Take care, everybody, and I will see you soon.